All right, everybody. I hope I am live. I hope we're live. Let me double check. Make sure that we, yeah, we are indeed live. Great. Good evening, everybody. Um, rarely do I do shows late in the evening on the weekend. Um, but I am thrilled to be here with you on a weekend after attending uh, evening mass. Um, and we'll be here briefly. We won't be here very long. So you may be saying, William, late Saturday night. You're keeping me up late. Don't worry. We won't take a whole lot of time. But I think you're going to really enjoy the topic that we're going to cover today. Indeed, what comes up very often in dialogue are people wondering, uh, should I convert to Eastern Orthodoxy? Should I convert to Orthodoxy? You have found it to have become the new kid in the block. But is that really the real case in the real world? It, well, spoiler alert, it is not. Uh, in terms of uh, orthodoxy having massive amounts of converts, it's very popular when it comes to online and the apologetics world, not in the real, on the boots, on the ground world. But that doesn't change the fact that in the online sphere, it has become quite prominent to hear that people are jumping ship and they're going over to Eastern Orthodoxy because the ancient apostolic faith has been preserved there. And, uh, you know, Pope Francis is a horrific, horrible, polarizing guy, has torn the faith asunder, um, and it's time to jump ship. And is, is all of that true? And is it true that Eastern Orthodoxy has preserved uh, the fullness of the faith in, in terms of apostolicity? I think a very well-read person, and I want to be very fair, not, I, I don't want to say that people that convert are not very well-read. Clearly, we're reading history, we're coming to different conclusions, right? But by looking at some of these comments, I can tell that not only are we reading history differently, but some people are reading history and not understanding the arguments at all. Now, one certain figure who has, um, has, a, uh, had a, has a channel, excuse me, it's a friend of mine named Kyle King who was converted to Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, and if you think that this is going to be a show bashing him or trashing him, you're you're you come to the wrong place. I don't have anything negative to say about Kyle. Kyle's a great guy, a great family guy, God-fearing man, holy guy from all that I know. I've done multiple shows with him. He's a great guy. I think he's wrong, and I don't think he has read the historical information. I don't know if I want to say fairly or well, very evidently by looking at a few comments that he's made as of late, can tell very much so that he's very confused on a lot of issues in terms of certain things. So today we're going to focus on a few things, and we're going to talk in general about Eastern Orthodoxy. Should you convert? But of course, I'm going to keep you waiting on pins and needles. If you had to wait, because I had the show originally scheduled for 9.30, 20 minutes ago, I apologize. If you had to wait a little bit extra, it's not too bad to wait three more minutes as I play that wonderful, beautiful music as I remove my disgusting, horrible face and I put the wonderful, beautiful Ave Maria. And we venerate our Holy Mother Mary, our Immaculate Mother Mary. Remember that point. Remember that because we're going to talk about how it is important to focus on the teaching of Holy Mary being our all-immaculate Holy Mother Mary. Don't worry, we will be right back in just a moment. Thank you. 
Glad to be back with you, everybody. And uh, look, I, I can't get to every question immediately. It seems to be a lot of overwhelming, uh, an overwhelming response. I'll try to get to as many as I can before we're done. Like I said, a Tuesday, a Saturday night, late Saturday night. Won't be here too late, but we'll be here enough to talk about uh, a few things. Purgatory, the Immaculate Conception, the canon. Uh, maybe another show will dive into the filioque and the papacy and any other issue if people are interested in that, uh, as we've done shows on that before. Indeed, I've debated a scholar on the filioque many years back. Hope to dive into that again. But begin by noting that um, <clears throat> a good friend, well, I, I don't want to misrepresent, a, a guy that I consider a friend. I, I have not talked to him or kept in touch with him uh, in a while, even though I consider him to be a friend and we've done shows together. We've uh, we've, we've spoken uh, in depth in the past and consider him to be a brother, uh, has left Catholicism for Eastern Orthodoxy. And uh, I, I've got to say I'm not shocked, and I don't say that disrespectfully. Um, maybe a few weeks back, um, people directed me to certain comments that Cal had been making online. And uh, in fact, uh, my dear brother, Dr. David Savaris, can testify. He can post down here in the comments if you want, well before Kyle ever announced it, well before he ever came forth. Uh, I told uh, Dr. Savaris there, there's problems with the guy's theology. I told him right away. Uh, the guy does not come across as Catholic. I, I, I detected it immediately. Did I think he would eventually convert? Uh, I didn't. I thought that he would run along the lines of, because uh, we know very well that there are a lot of Eastern Catholics that will adopt Eastern Catholicism all the while bashing Catholicism their whole life. Uh, you find it very prevalent in the Melkites. Not all of them, my dear Melkite friends, but very often the Melkites, um, some of them, you know, they cannot stand themselves. They'll attack Vatican I. They'll think Vatican I is not applicable to themselves and what have you. Mind-boggling and mind-blowing. So I thought he'd be along those lines, but it didn't shock me when I heard that he had converted. I um, already detected an air of uh, anti-Catholic sentiment, if you will. I don't want to call him anti-Catholic, though. I don't think he is. And if he is, well, when the time comes and he does videos or presentations, being anti-Catholic, we'll deal with him. But to, to get to the original point, if anybody thinks this is a show that's going to bash in Kyle, I, I wish nothing but the best upon Kyle and his family. The times that we've spoken and done shows together, I find him to be a sincere, holy, God-loving, God-fearing man. And I think that he really does mean well. And I think that, look, I'll tell you right away, there is never an easy way or easy time to convert, ever. When I went from Protestantism to Catholicism, it was the hardest thing I ever did. I lost family and friends. And I wouldn't change, have, I wouldn't change it for the world, ever. That was a long time ago now. I had hair back then. It was a real long time ago. Um, and I've been Catholic for a long time. So at least I'm consistent in that. Thank the good Lord. May the Lord preserve us um, and, and preserve us from ever falling into the, the pits of, of, uh, of error. Uh, may the Lord preserve us in his wonderful sacraments as well. But <clears throat> you've got a very popular kind of idea online where you have people that do not like Pope Francis. Look, if there's one thing that I don't do here, and you might be disappointed, I don't dive into controversies or politics. I deal with theology, man. I write books on a debate, period. Uh, I have a debate coming up on the Immaculate Conception in, I think, a couple of weeks. God willing, the moderator had a family uh, tragedy, so we had to push it. And I, I spend about 10 to 12 hours a day preparing Writing, reading, prepping. I debate and I write about theology. I don't dive or delve into politics. I don't do that. What for? Well, you can be actually translating church father material that will edify people for generations to come. Why would I waste my time? So you're not going to come to my channel ever finding an eye-popping, misleading thumbnail for clicks or controversy. Do I think it works? I know for a fact it'll work. Look at Taylor Marshall's channel. I know for a fact it would work. Uh, there was one point in time where Taylor Marshall did real theology. Go look. 
You used to do topics like the Immaculate Conception and what have you, the Assumption and all this. But, you know, those don't make your channel go viral. Doing real theological work, your channel's not going to go viral that way. But I wouldn't sell my soul out for anything in the world. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, I wouldn't be able to put my head in the pillow and sleep well if I wasn't doing real theological work. So you're never going to find me selling out, ever. That being said, people are going to think that the papacy of Pope Francis is a very polarizing one. And with that opinion of theirs, very often you will find people <clears throat> looking for an apostolic faith they can jump to where they don't have to deal with a big bad wolf, Pope Francis, thinking that the grass is greener on the other side. So what you've got is you've got a massive problem in that you've got people going over to orthodoxy that don't even know what the Eastern Orthodox themselves believe. Now, I want to be very clear. I'm not accusing Kyle of that at all. Notice how I talked about Kyle for a moment. I've moved beyond that. I don't want to paint all these people as buffoons. They're not. But the massive majority of these people were previously Protestant, and they find orthodoxy more easy to digest. And how could you not? If you've got icons, you got Mary, you got the sacraments, you got a larger Bible, but you don't have that dastardly Pope Francis that is a liberal, a Freemason, uh, he worships a devil, he, he believes in universalism, hell is empty, everything, Judas is dancing in heaven, everything. You don't have that, that demonic figure. Remember, all of those are caricatures. But you don't have all that. The grass is greener. There's rainbows and, and, and ponies that fly on the rainbows over there on the other side. They're not. Uh, if you see the scandals in the news of of um, clown masses being given and uh, luchador priests dressed up uh, with liturgical abuses galore on the other side, and you don't see that with an Eastern Orthodoxy, are, does that mean that there are no abuses over there? No, that means that they are a much, much smaller faith and the media at times don't even know they exist. They're not going to focus on them. But if you know where to look, you'll find scandals everywhere. Not only in Catholicism, Protestantism, Orthodoxy, everywhere you look. Because we are a fallen human race. We're fallen. We're a mess. We need our Lord in the sacraments, period. So that's something to point to, that it's popular to seek out an apostolic faith that you think is Catholicism light without the Pope. Without realizing that you, if you go from Catholicism to Eastern Orthodoxy, by and large, you're abandoning the faith of the fathers. You're abandoning the Immaculate Conception, which, by the way, is a very thorny issue. I wouldn't want to be Eastern Orthodox today and realize that the great saints of old, those Eastern saints, they all believed in it. They believed in the Immaculate Conception. Palamas, Brienos, uh, Mark of Ephesus. Uh, what's his name? I forget. There's another patriarch. I forget his name. They don't venerate him today. They used to venerate him. Um, thanks to uh, modern day changes, they no longer venerate him, but they venerated him in the past. Uh, the Immaculate Conception was, uh, there was no issue holding to it at Basil Ferrara Florence, the failed reunion council. That tells you everything. It was believed East and West. So these are just some of the reasons why I could never be Eastern Orthodox. But should you convert, the very quick and easy answer is no. If you are Protestant and you're on the fence, I would recommend diving in deep. Now, if anybody wants to know what I would recommend they read, read up on the papacy, read up on the filioque, read up on the canon. And you may be wondering, well, what, what are you talking about on the canon? We'll talk about it in a moment. Read up on the Immaculate Conception as well. Look, you're going to have a big problem there. Big problem if you think that Eastern Orthodoxy fills in all those gaps for you. Um, look at some of the comments. I have no idea what people are saying. God bless everybody. I uh, hope we don't have any trolls. And if we do, we've got some amazing and incredible mods 
Uh, get, if, you, if you encounter any trolls, get them out of here. Get them out of here. And I trust you all. Um, see somebody say Kyle Barrel H Faith. That is the channel. And he, I, I recommend that you um, subscribe to it. Raul Romero. Brother, I have no clue what you're trying to say, brother. I, I, no clue on earth, my dear friend. Can you please give a satisfactory answer to how we can be saved if Mary is not a human like us? Raul, hermano, I don't know what you're reading, brother. But I can tell you right now, uh, you should pick up a theological manual, my friend. You should actually read not only Catholic theology, you should read Mariology in general, brother, because I can tell you are not reading any Mariology at all. Any, and I don't, I'm not trying to be rude, but I can tell you are not just not well read, you're not read at all. You're not reading anything. And, and by reading, I don't mean Google alone, brother. I mean picking up a book and reading. Pick up a Mariology book. You're not going to find any Catholic on the planet, my friend, that will argue that Mary is not a human. What are you talking about, brother? Mary's a creature. Mary is a creature. We give Mary dulia, duluo. We don't give her latrevo, which is latria, which is worship given to God and God alone, brother. We don't. Mary is a creature. Mary died, had her holy dormition and holy bodily assumption, my friend. I have no clue what you're saying. I will try and let me try and steel man that for you, my friend. And let me try and give the argument you usually find from the Orthodox. I'm going to pretend to be you for a moment, Raul, and I'm going to pretend to break it down better. Catholics, you guys believe that Mary was immaculate. She never had any stain of sin. But that would mean that she really wasn't human because Christ had to die for some kind of sin that she had. Thus, you're making her into almost a deity. But you'll hear that brought up sometimes. But it comes stems from a misunderstanding on original sin. I'll be debating the Reverend Dr. Ramsey on original sin, Eastern Orthodox scholar. And I'm glad he's finally getting the respect he deserves. The brother Allen did a show. And I am glad the brother Allen put the Reverend Dr. Ramsey at the very top tier of the bare, very best Eastern Orthodox he has to offer. Because even if you don't like his accent, even if you don't like the level of argumentation he puts forth as a debater, he can read Greek. He can read multiple languages right there on the spot. And he's a bona fide scholar, not like these other guys playing Connect Four. The Reverend Dr. Ramsey's doing real work. And I give a tip of the hat to that. Anybody doing real work, I give a tip of the hat to them. So, uh, we go onward. Brother, how you doing? You heard me on Relevant Radio. You're awake? Wow. A lot of people don't know. Uh, that I am the resident apologist there at Relevant Radio. And many people don't know because many people are in bed when I'm on the air for them very, very early in the morning. But if any of you are ever awake when I'm on the air in Relevant Radio, I am their resident apologist. If you're ever awake, call in. Give me a hello. Shout out to me. McVine. <laughs> yeah, you're right there. You are right on, brother. I believe that is you, right? Um, Alexander, I think. Hope you're doing well, brother. Great to see you. Reach out to me. I have got those multiple videos that I need to send you, brother, that I've added to. I've added another part, but I won't mention what that is on the air right now. John, I, I saw John there earlier. John, I hope you are doing well, my friend. I hope you're doing well. Hope everybody is doing well tonight. Everybody. Not only them, but how about we dive in? Now, I want to touch upon a few issues. Number one, <clears throat> when talking about, let's see if I can find it. I think I have it here. I do. Wonderful.
All right. And I promise everybody, I will try to get to your questions in a moment. In a moment. Be patient with me. So th this is what I want to touch upon. Let's touch upon this first. <clears throat> and I promise you all, I will definitely get to your questions. Thank you very much, Logan, for that super chat. God bless you, brother. I will get to you in a moment. I promise you, do not worry. Every super chat and everybody that I get the time to get to, I promise I'll get to you in a moment. Do not worry. Do not worry one, one bit. All right. My dear brother, Elijah, who, in my opinion, by the way, we're going to be debating together, two-on-two -two debate, defending the Immaculate Conception very, very soon. I am pumped to, to be debating with my brother. I am thrilled that we're going to get the opportunity to debate together. And in my opinion, one of the best when it comes to defending the Immaculate Conception. Now, he wrote on, and he directed us to it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known. I, I'd be very, I'm going to confess to you, I don't visit Kyle, Kyle's channel at all, if ever. Not that I don't like Kyle. I don't find the content compelling. He deals a lot with Harry Potter and with uh, Tolkien, Lewis, and not that there's anything wrong with that at all. Only that I don't find it to be my cup of tea. Nothing wrong. I'm not putting the guy down. Only that I don't find that to be compelling, and I don't I'm, I have no interest in that. So I never go over to his channel, ever. Um, unless somebody would tell me, go check out a video there. Then I'll go. Not that I think the material is bad. I've never even watched one video of those. They could be very good. And likely, knowing Kyle, they're probably good. But Elijah told us about the comedy made. He said, how, and referring to Kyle becoming Orthodox, how does this change your view on the Blessed Mother, if at all, specifically on the Immaculate Conception? Elijah knew right where to go. Because the majority of modern day Orthodox, even if they don't know it, they have been taught and trained under the Catechism of Romanides. And even if a an Orthodox says, I have no idea who that is. They don't need to know. The fact that so much theology of Romanides has crept into the church as Orthodoxy has evolved and evolved and shed many of the apostolic doctrines they once held to, it's problematic. So you're going to find, until Romanides, the massive majority of those within Eastern, Eastern Christianity affirming the Immaculate Conception. So right on, Elijah made a great point. Does it affect your belief in the Immaculate Conception? And Kyle pretty much affirms that it does, sadly. How lamentable is that? He'll tell Elijah, great to hear from you. I've enjoyed your work over the years. I have too. Tip of the hat, Elijah the Titan is the man. For me, Mary is a Panagia. And is our immaculate Teotokos, of course. You know the Orthodox Catholic dialogue very well. Now, you're going to hear that very often from the Orthodox. They almost train to tell you that they will give you all kinds of flowery replies as to how they view Mary. She's our Panagia, ever virgin, and we even call her immaculate. But they will flower it all up right before affirming that Mary was under the dominion of the devil even for a short period of time. And as an apostolic Christian, that should not be acceptable. I'm telling you right now. Because ultimately it comes down to that. If you believe Mary ever was tainted with original sin, as laid out in the Bible, well then she was under the dominion of the devil even only for a short period of time. And Augustine tells you we do not hand Mary over to the dominion of the devil. We do not hand her over. As imprecise as Augustine may have been with his Augustinian bent Mariology, Augustine was correct. He argued that we do not hand Mary over to the dominion of the devil. But Kyle will go on and he will note that the debate revolves around the nature of time and how Christ saved her within time. As you know, Aquinas believes she had to be sanctified after her conception because she needed to be saved as a creature already existing and not one about to exist. It is much more nuanced than that for Aquinas. And later on in his life, he shows evidence of 
a very different kind of view. Do I think that he ever adopted the Immaculate Conception? I don't. I'm willing to have my mind changed in that. And I've wanted to have it changed for a long time. But I think that there's a form of the early teaching that you find in early pre-Scotus and post-Scotus schools, even the post ones that didn't completely agree with Scotistic theology, that showed a kind of figure of Mary that died because of the Depotum Peccati. Now, of course, we get into very uh, deep theological discussions and deep theological language. But Aquinas' belief was shows a confusion within his mind. And one that he is definitely trying to reconcile. He definitely wants to argue and believe the very best when it comes to Mary. And according to, in my opinion, the greatest living Thomistic scholar, the great Dr. Minor, Thomas Aquinas never flat out denies the Immaculate Conception in the final writings of his life. Now, does that mean that even though he never flat out denies it, that he ever fully accepted it? In my opinion, I don't think it means that. I don't. And I've watched and I've read multiple videos and articles on the, on the issue of Aquinas and the Immaculate Conception. And I'm going to go with Dr. Minor for that. But then we, we encounter more problems here because Kyle will say, many popes in the, and saints in the West before Scotus really do talk like this, debating when she was sanctified in the womb. Well, I don't agree with Kyle there. And I know the argument. I know the argument. They're going to bring up Pope Leo the Great, Pope uh, Innocent, and many others and claim that, well, you know, they're, they don't know or they don't show that they believe that she was sanctified, that she was created all holy. The problem was that Kyle can't give you any evidence of that at all. <clears throat> because what you're going to find, you're going to find multiple popes Later in history, you're right about that, debating and wondering, okay, when did that sanctification occur? And a lot of these texts are not in English anywhere. A lot of them aren't. But well before the dogma was ever, ever promulgated, you will find these popes, even though the dogma has not been declared, telling you they, <coughs> <coughs> forgive me, they will lay out, a number of propositions. And over and over, they will take the greater one for Mary, that of being Mary never having been under the dominion of the devil, never at any moment of her life. So I don't agree with that statement, that many popes believed had an issue with when she was created immaculate or when she was made immaculate. Now, is it a fact? Some don't even talk about it without a doubt. And we don't have any problem at all arguing that the only one without sin is our Lord. Now, if we had a problem with that, then even the Orthodox would have a problem with that statement. The fact of the matter is you have fathers that will make that statement and then all the while believe that Mary was created immaculate. Where is the contradiction? There's not one there. Within Mariological and Christological discussions, there has always been that distinction of one that is without sin by nature. Our Lord had a divine nature before he took the human nature from his immaculate mother Mary. Now, a sinlessness by nature is what our Lord possesses. What our immaculate mother Mary has by grace is a sinlessness by that, by grace, as Ineffabilis Deus tells you. So there is no contradiction at that point. Not at all. Rather, there is an inability to distinguish between those very clear theological points that the early fathers made over and over, such as Pope St. Leo the Great, who all the while can tell you there is only one that has no sin, referring to our Lord's very divine nature. And now we're not saying this human nature has sin. We don't want any, any creeps to come along and try and misinterpret that. And then he'll, oh, he'll come back and in his tome very clearly tell you our Lord took the human nature from his mother. That human nature had no what? No guilt. Meaning that human nature he took from his mother was without original sin. Connect the dots. 
Others, Kyle says, will talk about her maintaining her purity, but still being sanctified and purified more and more. Uh, I, I truly believe Kyle is, is a little confused here because um, <clears throat> on the one hand, he's he totally correct there. Many fathers will talk about her purity, her complete purity, Kyle, and then her being purified. That, that would be the growing in holiness, the growing in grace, as Cyril of Jerusalem very clearly taught. As many fathers taught, as you know very well, multiple top patristic scholars confirmed that. The great, where do I have the book? I had the book somewhere here. Goodness, right when I need the book, I can't find the book. Are you kidding? Oh, there we go. <clears throat> the great, greatest living Mariologist right now, the great Reverend Dr. Kappas, traces the utilization of that Greek prokathartisa in the Greek tradition. Now, in the Latin West, we can find the very same theology there for the purification of Mary, the growth in grace. And then over there on the Syriac side, Dr. Brock, he will agree with the Reverend Dr. Coppice in that point. Who, by the way, I just did. I just met and got to hang out with the great Dr. Brock. If you could only have tallied how long we discussed and presented on Mariology. The great Dr. Brock has no issue with teachings like the Immaculate Conception. He will tell you, we don't have it as a dogma, but we have no issue with the teaching, as long as we define it the way the Syriac tradition would have defined it. But we go onward. I can agree with Kyle here. Oh, here, let me, let me move on. Many fathers speak about her nature being purified at the coming of Christ into her womb. Now, I think that we need to nuance that. Because if we're referring to figures like St. Cyril of Jerusalem and many others, they will talk about Mary already being holy prior, prior to the overshadowing. Thus, a growth in grace and growth in holiness is in view. Is that word in the Bible, purification, always in reference to something that is tainted with sin that needs to be cleaned of sin? No, not in the biblical Greek. Not the biblical early fathers either. And clearly, if one is presented as holy, and then we're told that is the holy Virgin Mary, but she will be overshadowed and sanctified and purified so as to carry the creator of the universe. What does that tell you? If she's already all holy, but she's going to receive more sanctification and holiness to be able to carry the creator of the universe, that very clearly, as the great O'Carroll and as the great Scotus noted, it's a growth in grace. That's what it is. You see, we run into a very thorny, very deep, deep theological discussion when talking about the Immaculate Conception and a dialogue that the Eastern Orthodox are never going to come out of on top, ever. Ever, because they are in a big bind. What are you going to do with the fact that at Florence, prior to Florence, right there at the failed reunion council, this was on the table and they agreed with it. That was not a point of contention. And I'll tell you one thing. Mark of Ephesus and his boys, they were looking for anything to argue about. Anything. Now I know they may throw that ball back at us and say, hey, you guys with your forgeries. You guys had forgeries too. But... Let's be fair. We were, we were all looking for anything to argue about. We were all looking for anything to argue about. But the Immaculate Conception was not on the table as a point of dispute. So don't come to me and tell me, man, well, you know, 1854, you guys waited really late. No, there was no problem east and west there at Ferrara, Florence. None. And you're in a big a bit of a bind if you are Orthodox and you deny this today. There are many within Orthodoxy that I know that agree with it. You're in a bit of a bind there. What are you going to do with Palamos? And we've read, we have read the, the arguments coming forth trying to rebut the very clear language that Palamos talks about. All holy seed, that seed that is purified. Of course, many don't know of that text because people don't read Palamos in the Greek or don't have the ability to. That is why the actual on the ground, on the boots, real Orthodox scholars are not going to make these arguments. 
What are you going to do with Mark of Ephesus, Zatatis? What are you going to do about, uh, I'm not sure if you want to call him his teacher or his colleague, Brenios. Uh, but you can go on and on in that list. You can go on and on. But <clears throat> I am aware of the Augustinian quotes where there's no way around it that Augustine believes Mary died because Mary came from a mortal human stock, the stock of Adam. <clears throat> Do I think Mary's death in Augustine is a defeater for the Immaculate Conception? I don't. I don't. And I don't agree with the way he lays out that Mary died because Mary uh, had ancestral sin. I don't agree with that. I don't at all. Um, <clears throat> because one thing is very clear. Um, if you look at, and I'd recommend looking at Augustine's Contra Julian, his unfinished uh, opus Contra Julian, where in my opinion, following his teacher Ambrose, he is doing his very best to argue that Mary was never under the dominion of the devil. Never under the dominion of the devil. And um, there is one point where he will... And I want to put it up there right here because this will get quoted a lot. We'll find it quoted a ton. <clears throat> For among those born of a woman, the Holy Lord Jesus was absolutely the only one who did not experience the contagion of earthly corruption because of the new manner of his immaculate birth. Now, I've heard that quoted over and over and over as if it comes from Augustine. But the problem is, is that when you examine that text, Augustine himself, that isn't his opinion. Now, did it come from the pen of Augustine? No doubt, but is that actually from Augustine? No, Augustine will follow it up by telling you, listen again to another passage that he, referring to the heretic, says, for among those born of a woman, the Holy Lord Jesus was absolutely, we can go on and on. Augustine is scoffing at these statements. He replies immediately after this quotation from Julian by positing rather demanding. Look at what he says. He gets quite animated, and rightly so. Augustine will say, Answer me, Julian, what is this contagion of earthly corruption which the Lord Jesus alone of those born of a woman did not experience? You are not permitted to twist and <coughs> to distort as you have tried to do those words into another sense than that in which Ambrose spoke of them. And then look at what he says. Look at what he says. I think I'm going to run out of text. Here we go. Uh, let me correct that. I forgot to. Augustine will continue noting. We do not hand Mary over to the devil, because of the condition of her birth, we do not do this precisely because that con condition is removed or undone. Now, what does Augustine mean by that? There are multiple scholars that believe that he truly was affirming the immaculate conception or the immaculate creation of Mary. That's debated, even though Gambero didn't take a position on it. Gambero rather argued that Augustine was talking about the sinlessness of Mary in terms of her never actually committing a sin. But there are multiple great Mariologists, Ulithor and Bede one, that truly believed, arguing by the language of the text here, that Augustine believed Mary was never under the dominion of the devil. How can you argue that Augustine, on the one hand, would have argued that Mary had original sin even for any moment in time? If he's arguing against the heretic and says, look, we don't hand Mary over to the devil. 
And over and over, Augustine does tell you, having original sin means you are under the dominion of the devil. But he's telling you here, we don't hand Mary over to the devil. We don't hand her over to the devil. That is open to a robust dialogue. Robust. Now, the other point that I don't have the time to get into, but that I think we need to, to, to really, really lay, lay down here, is that without a doubt, Augustine believed Mary died because Mary was of the stock of Adam. And there are many fathers that believe that. She was a mortal. She died because she was a mortal human being. But I don't agree with the interpretation saying that Augustine believed Mary died because she was fallen with original sin. You're not going to find that in Augustine. I don't agree with that. Now, we agree here where Kyle says that uh, Augustine will go on to talk about the sinlessness of Mary. We agree there. One thing that I would like to also add for people looking, tuning in, is that another figure that denied the Immaculate Conception, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, I, I would recommend you read his denial of it. Because all the while, St. Bernard will deny the Immaculate Conception, and then he will say, look, this hasn't been defined by the church yet. If the church would define it, I would gladly yield to believing in it. But he could not understand or grasp, really truly grasp, the theology behind it. He erroneously believed this was a late feast. <coughs> Very clearly, he was wrong. We know that from multiple Dormition fathers and from the writings as well of Romano Zemelidis, we know he was wrong. He thought that the Feast of the Conception was very late. But he tells you flat out, if the church were to define it, I would yield my authority, my belief, to the authority of the church, he tells you. But the other issue that I want to point out is Kyle says that the dominant position in orthodoxy is the dominant position of the fathers of the church. That is not true. Not, not true at all. You've got the Proto-Evangelium. You've got Hippolytus of Rome. You've got multiple early fathers very early on that clearly believed Mary was all immaculate in her creation. Look, let me be very honest. The clear biblical teaching of Holy Mary as the new ark of the new covenant it doesn't work if you deny the Immaculate Conception. I'm sorry. It doesn't work. The very idea, the very typological connection of the construction, of the construction of incorruptibility of the acacia wood of the new art, of the old art, in parallelism to the construction, the creation of the new art, Holy Mary, the new ark theology, which is not only typology, but rather rises above it because of all of the connections in the text, doesn't work if you deny the Immaculate Conception. I'm sorry. It doesn't. Furthermore, the greater problem you have, if you're Orthodox and you deny the Immaculate Conception, is by the time you get to the great era of the great Dormition and Assumption Fathers, Andrew of Crete, Germanus, John Damascene, Del Technos of Livias, and I can go on and on. They're talking about Mary's nature. How was Mary created? Why did Mary die? Not a one of them that talk about her death. And it was the perfect time to say she died because she had original sin. Not a one of them tell you that. Not even one of them will tell you that. And what are they all doing? They're connecting the biblical imagery of Mary as a new ark immaculately conceived with a holy dormition and body and soul bodily assumed into heaven. They're all doing it. Wham! They're all doing it. And during my debate in Pikes with Aquinas with the Reverend Dr. Ramsey, I posed that to him, and there was no cogent reply at all. You're not going to be able to reply to that cogently if you deny the Immaculate Conception. If you deny it, you're in a bind. So <clears throat> the one thing that I hear very often, and I hear it so often that I cannot but chuckle, is the idea that, look, you guys, look, man, 
I know we've got issues with jurisdiction. We, we got them all over the place. You guys do too. But we, we have a unity in faith that you guys just do not have. Look at the rad tribes. Look at the St. David Contest. Look at people that they don't care what Pope Francis utters, that have no problem denying it, that call him Bergoglio. If you believe that you possess unity in faith, I don't know who tricked you into believing that. I don't know. Because I can quote a bunch of scholars that will tell you the Deuterocanonical books are holy writ. And then I can quote a bunch of top scholars of the Russian Biblical Society and many other top Orthodox scholars that deny that they are even canonical. Don't tell me you've got unity of faith. Don't, come on. I mean, we're, we're clearly playing a game here. And at the end of the day, over here in Catholicism, we've got clearly, we've got clear dogma that has been laid out that if you deny it as a Catholic, well, you're denying Catholic teaching. Very clearly. Unity of faith? What would Palamas or Mark of Ephesus or those great Eastern giants have thought if they could peek into 2024 and realize that the, the school of Romanides has taken over and there is no issue denying the Immaculate Conception and all kinds of things that were believed, all believed early on. Now, do I believe every single father believed him? I don't think every single father even taught about it or wrote about it. But you've got a problem there. Bernard, as we mentioned, it's very clear. If the church defines it, I'll believe it. And if you think that the belief in the Immaculate Conception of Mary reared its head in 1854 or reared its head around the time of Scotus, then you're not very well acquainted with the ecumenical councils. We can go as early, <clears throat> as early as the Acta of Ephesus. And you wonder why the Oriental Orthodox have no problem affirming it. <clears throat> you can go as early as the Act of Ephesus and find it being taught there in the Acta. And then clearly affirmed and believed in Basin. Trent, Trent very clearly showing the belief that Mary was immaculate as well, well before 1854 and if in, in Ephibilis Deus. But a lot of what I'm saying, I'm not attacking Kyle in any way. I want to be very clear. Our general replies, Kyle could very well come back in a day or two and say, hey, I affirm that. And great. I know a few Orthodox that affirm the Immaculate Conception. So it clearly is not in reference to all of them. Just very clearly, more and more, this is becoming an issue where they have no problem denying it. And I have a problem because they are clearly, in my opinion, moving further and further away from the faith of their fathers. <clears throat> we mentioned purgatory earlier. I think Kyle believes in purgatory. We did a show on it. Be shocked if he moved away from believing that. But uh, and I think Kyle has a very um, fascinating view on uh, aerial toll houses as well. I think he's done. He's really done his homework there. But I don't think Kyle has any problem with purgatory. Another issue that I brought up, another issue that I brought up earlier, I told you all I'd be talking about, would be the canon. I'm going to dive into that in a moment. But now I do want to look and see what you all have been talking about. Let me look. Don't want to miss anything. Everybody, thank you. God bless you for the super chats. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Greatly appreciate it. Let me try and see. By the way, if you do have any questions, please do not do not hesitate. I'm trying to see what. Wonderful. Here we go. 
Thank you so much, Logan, for that super chat. William, I have been reading the seven ecumenical councils. They are filled with such beautiful Christology. They are, Logan, aren't they? <clears throat> I'd recommend you check out a series I did. I recall I was reached, they reached out to me at Virgin Most Powerful Radio, and they wanted to do a whole series on Christology. So I began with the Bible. Then I went to the Apostolic Fathers. Then I went to the early councils. I went all the way, I think, to Chalcedon. I did a bunch of shows. Go check them out. You can find them on my channel. Loaded with incredible theology. Um, uh, some Easterners would point to Pope Vigil. Uh, please be a little bit more specific, brother. I have heard various arguments utilized uh, trying to argue against Pope Vigilius. Um, and I hope that you can let me know exactly what you're referring to. I don't think that any good argument has ever been levied utilizing Pope Vigilius to argue against papal infallibility. I've, I've, I've heard it brought up very often. Uh, but if you can be a little specific, brother, I will definitely dive in. If you're no longer watching, promise to get to you in an email. But yeah, if you can be a little bit more specific, brother. I've heard certain people bring up arguments that I don't, I think actually the Julius works against them more than anything. Ernestos, yes, you are right. St. Peter is the rock, no doubt, brother. Okay, I'm going down the line. Saw a video of Jimmy Akin where they went through a few of the horrible popes in history. <laughs> don't understand how anyone could be Roman Catholic after watching Sabiduria Orthodoxa. Uh, you know, buddy, if you base, if you're basing the religion that you're a part of on the uh, sinlessness or the sins of former people, you're in a bit of a bind. There was a point in time where the followers of our Lord the massive majority were worshiping golden calf. They were committing idolatry. Uh, do you think that the correct religion should have been abandoned back then merely because a massive majority were committing the grave sin of idolatry? Uh, you got a big problem there. Furthermore, there is there are sins on the hands of all of the early fathers. None of them were perfect. None of them. Uh, so, you know, you got a problem there if you're going to be utilizing sinful individuals um, and then say, well, how can anybody be a Catholic because of that? You do realize that we share many early fathers, Sabiduria, many in common. And by that very same criteria, which is a very poor one, we would be rejecting the faith all throughout, all throughout history. Not a good one, my friend. You can do much better than that. Let me see. I am willing to do an in-depth video on Pope Vigilius because of your super chat. If you want me to do a video just on Pope Vigilius, email me at william at patristicpillars.com if you want me to do that for you. Uh, Byzantine finest, God bless you. St. Peter's a rock. Kyle mentioned orthodoxy preserving apostolic tradition more, which confuses me when it comes to the primacy. You're right. And I hope I've touched upon a few other things already thus far. You're definitely right there, brother. Uh, when you look at the primacy of the of the Bishop of Rome, it, it really does no favors but uh, for the Orthodox. But the reason I'm touching upon the canon, the Immaculate Conception, I have not heard any arguments that Kyle has made on the papacy. If he does do them, I'll reply. But rather, the only things that I've heard Kyle bring up are the canon and the Immaculate Conception. We'll get to the canon in a moment. By the way, I recommend seven ecumenical councils to everyone. They are filled with such beautiful truths of the Catholic Christian faith. Praying for all. Logan, thank you for your prayers, brother. God keep you. God bless you and your whole family, brother, without a doubt. Kai, where can I read a systematic Orthodox, Orthodox Trinitarian theology to understand what they mean when they appeal to energetic manifestation, temporal possessions, etc.? cetera? Is there a history of the theology? I, a great... A great blog that I'd recommend, Kai. I'd recommend you go read Perry Robinson's blog. I don't think he's ever written a book. But <clears throat> even though Perry is not a debater, I would put him in the upper echelon, the upper tier of their top apologists. They don't have many that are up there that are doing real work. They don't have at all. 
And when I mean real work, I mean real theological work. Uh, um, um, Perry is one of the few. Uh, not a debater like Dr. like the Reverend Dr. Ramsey, but I think he does have a lot of really good stuff on that particular issue. Look, what I recommend to every Catholic, devour Orthodox theology. You need to learn what they believe, man. Devour it. Read Bradshaw. Even read anything you can find from Romanini so you can see how much the faith has evolved. Then I'd go read the Council of Jerusalem, 1672, and I'd go through anything I could get my hands on to read. But another thing that I'd recommend, go to the academic authors. Don't read, look, don't go to the polemical garbage you're going to find online where they're not doing any real work at all. Read real theological work being put together. Go and read, um, I'd recommend anything from Meyendorf, uh, Callistus Ware. You know, they're top scholars, even though a lot of the people today will say, no, you know, don't read them. Go ahead and read them. I definitely recommend you read them. Trying to go down the line. People, thank you. God bless you. God keep you for the super chat. <clears throat> Trying to see. I hope I am not missing anything. I promise I will try to get to everything later on. Yeah. Byzantine tradition is that Holy Mary is spotless. Akranta. Yeah, that that by the way, that's a, that is a rare Greek word used for her. <clears throat> that will get utilized a little bit later in history, but uh, a very significant Greek word utilized for her. You're gonna find that uh I want to say the Theodotus. Theotechnos does use it. I'm not sure if Theodotus is one. I'd have to pull up my, my patristics. The man who tries to put a spot on, on the all spot list is putting up a sign saying, don't even think I'm in the true church. You're right about that, John. You're definitely right about that. Okay. Yes, Suburban, you are correct. You're the man. Great, great point there. I am Oriental Orthodox. We love you, brother or sister. God bless you. My dear friends, I, I have a great love for the Oriental Orthodox because oh, they, unlike a lot of the Eastern Orthodox, but by the way, I love my Eastern Orthodox friends as well. I'm close friends with Reverend Dr. Ramsey and the Reverend Dr. Klinever. I'm close friends with them. I'm talking about those that want to be polemical. Look, we're 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 living in a tumultuous period in history. We should be trying to strive for unity more than anything else. I don't like those that look for polemical polemical battles more than anything else. Byzantine, thank you for that. By the way, if you have not yet gotten a copy of our book, what are you waiting for? Our book is the only one out there that will show you the development of the canon in Eastern Orthodoxy. will show you that even there, they have gone off. They have departed from apostolic tradition, even on the issue of the canon. And if you've not gotten a copy, if one of my mods could post a link to that book, I would greatly appreciate it. I would greatly appreciate it. Get a copy of the book if you've not gotten a copy yet. A complete history of the biblical canon. We cover the history of the canon. By the way, if anybody ever asked me, who is the man of the canon? Gary Machuda is the man. But Gary will deal primarily with the canon and Protestants. Gary has been telling me for a decade, William, there is nothing out there in dealing with the canonical issues in orthodoxy. And Father Coppins and myself agreed. So we updated Gigi's old tome massively, included brand new translations, looked at the critical text. Look, we don't play games. We're doing real theological work. Looked at the crit critical editions of Palamas. We looked at Mark of Ephesus and those great saints in the East. And we looked at the canonical texts of theirs that they're utilizing. And we traced the history of Trullo we looked at Laodicea, we looked at the words of Pope Agatha, and we showed how the early Catholic canon is the apostolic one. What did Augustine do? He queried the apostolic churches. That North African code was held 
East and West. It was held East and West for the longest time. So today, when Eastern Orthodoxy don't even know what their canon is, you've got a very clear departure from apostolic tradition. A very clear departure from apostolic tradition. Thank you for that, Ernestos. Thank you. Really, really do hope you, you enjoy it. We hope you enjoy that book. Mick Vine, thank you, brother. You are incredible. God keep you, brother. Can you comment on the real presence of God? <clears throat> you know, brother, I, we've done a whole show on it. So what I would recommend, uh, I've got no problem with the essence energies distinction. I would recommend you check out the full show I did with Dr. Goff on it. In fact, I think we break it down very easy to digest. I even did a whole show with Dr. Minor on that. Please go check that out. Logan, for you, my brother, I will do it. I will do it. I'll begin working on it. God willing, tomorrow, God willing, have it out within a week. I will do it, brother, for you. Thank you very much for that, daughter of Christ. Now, go. I want to return back to the issue of the canon. I want to return back to the issue of the canon because I don't think that is sabiduría. I never said that was a reason to be Catholic, my friend. You're the one that said that that's a reason to not be Catholic. I never said that was a reason to be Catholic. My friend, I have no clue what you're saying. A lo mejor hablas puro español. Podemos hablar en español. I am able to dialogue in multiple languages, my friend. I have no idea what you're talking about. I never claim being sinful is a reason to be Catholic. I turned it around on you, my friend. Uh, now, I'm giving you a very good reason, the Immaculate Conception. Come back and rebut that. We've done shows, by the way, in Spanish. <clears throat> by the way, people, if you ever want to consider, and I'll drop the link down below, if you ever want to consider becoming a patron, I am doing what I consider the most in-depth series on the Immaculate Conception ever done. Which, by the way, thank the good Lord, there are new videos that are going to be posted very soon. And I'm trying to find... Here we go. There are new videos, and I'm doing them in English, and I am doing them in Spanish. So if you ever want to look at those, by the way, they are on my Patreon. Well, we are doing scholarly courses in English and in Spanish on the Immaculate Conception. And I do believe the Immaculate Conception is very important to believe. Very, very important. Yep, read Meyendorf, read Metropolitan Callisto Square. No doubt. But let me go back up. Let me go back up. Wonderful, wonderful point. And I've, I've said it over and over again. My dear brother, Gary, is the man on the canon. We merely wanted to fill that one gap that we knew was there. The issue of the canon when dealing with Orthodox. Now, the other thing that, and by the way, this was pointed out to me, was shared with me. Uh, and I blotted out one name, uh, and it was shared with me because they were commenting on a debate that I had, a debate that I did <clears throat> with a Reverend Dr. Ramsey. We had a debate, and our debate was on the canon. It was a great, it was a fun debate. So we had a debate on the canon. And an individual made a post promoting that people watch the debate. And we had one, one individual, which I don't even know why I, I blurted his name out because you've got the name at the bottom there. I, a boneheaded move on my end. But anyway, um, Stewart says, we use the same canon as the Orthodox. We should, or they should rather, but he's wrong. He is wrong there. Uh, because within orthodoxy, there is no uniform belief on what the canon is. There is not. 
Now, if one individual would come back and say, no, we, we, we hold to the, the canon that you all utilize, uh, well, then we don't have any issue arguing that. Uh, we would agree with that. But the individual, Stuart, will say, the Church of Rome until the 4th century, when Damas, Damasus commissioned Jerome to complete the Latin Vulgate, Jerome believed falsely the Hebrew Masoretic text was purer than the Septuagint Greek. Even though the Septuagint was a good 400 years older than the Masoretic, he's partially right. Jerome believed in Hebrew verity and Jerome was wrong. But why did Jerome eventually come to believe in, in the Deuterocanon? What did Jerome say? Now, and we have the quote. You can find it in our book in the canon. Jerome yielded, he yielded to Pope Innocent. And later in his life, utilized the Deuter canon over and over as holy writ, over and over. So, but yeah, Jerome was wrong for holding to Hebrew verity. But the other thing that is problematic is Stuart seems to think that the Septuagint was canonized. And you very often are going to hear this very elementary argument for people that don't know better and have not read or ever studied the canon. The idea that the Vulgate was canonized. It wasn't. Where? What, what council? What local synod? Was it Hippo? Was it Carthage? Was it Rome 382? <laughs> Which one? Was it the, uh, the dubious canon in Laodicea? Where? What are you talking about? And then look at this. However, the story does not end there. For the Catholic Church uses more than just the Vulgate and the Septuagint. Wow, that really truly is news to me. By the way, utilization and what is canonical are very different. And I don't think either of them are able to make that distinction. Why? Because they've never studied the issue. In the Syrian Catholic churches, as with the Syrian Orthodox, the Syriac Peshitta canon is used, while the Ethiopian Somalian Catholic churches use follow the Ethiopian Orthodox. What planet are you on to make that argument? <coughs> I can tell you right now, there's one Catholic canon. One. And the idea that all of these Eastern churches utilize all these different kinds of canons is downright fantasy. I cannot help but laugh about that. They don't know what they're talking about. They've not done their homework. We've heard that argument used before. Do you know who love to use that argument? The Orthodox because they know the bind that they're in when it comes to the canon. So they'll reply and say, hey, well, you, you know, if we're in a bind, then all those other Catholic churches are too, because they use all kinds of different canons. They don't hold to the canon from Trent. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Utilization of other books does not mean that they are considered canonical. That's very important. Kyle will then reply and say, I've suggested this as well. Seems that Trent wanted to condemn the Protestant canon. <clears throat> Trent was most definitely dealing with Protestantism and not orthodoxy. But that doesn't matter. Because those books that are utilized by many orthodoxy today are called apocrypha. It doesn't matter. Even if you want to come to the table and say, look, Trent didn't condemn these other books. It condemned the Protestant truncated canon. The idea that the canon should be truncated, that, uh, that is what was condemned. Those other books are very clearly called Apocrypha. They're clearly called Apocrypha. So that's a problem that is unable to be dealt with. Um, and... I'm trying to find the, I wish I could pull the act up. I don't have it, but on hand, but either which way, um, when you look at what Trent did, it very clearly stipulates which books were, and I'm going to quote, transmitted as from hand to hand 
from the apostles. If those are the ones that were transmitted from hand to hand, if those are considered canonical, and if those other books are called apocrypha, no. Number one, no, the canon is not open. And two, number two, no, those other books don't have an opportunity to become canonical at a later period. And no, the idea that a Ukrainian or a Syriac or any other kind of Catholic church hold all different kinds of canons is downright ludicrous. Trent was an ecumenical council. It didn't need to deal specifically with the Eastern churches in order to make it clear that the canon is closed and those books and those alone are canonical, that are laid out. Was it dealing primarily with Protestantism? Nobody argues that. Nobody. But when it tells you those books and those alone are transmitted as from hand to hand by the apostles and calls those other books that are not part of the canon apocrypha, you got your answer right there. Furthermore, Kyle has a bigger problem. Were they really anathematized in the East? No, they didn't anathematize the East. For having Third Maccabees? I don't think so, and I don't think that was their intent. They also refused to condemn second marriages. Now, I'm not going to delve into that, but look at what he says right here before that. When, when asked to condemn larger canons that other apostolic churches possessed, they refused to do so. Now, as I'm scratching my dome because it gets a little confusing because Kyle will then say that at the very bottom, he says, Trent is complex. They're condemning Protestantism, Protestant notions, but they're very hesitant to condemn anything apostolic. Now, I want to be very clear these other extra books that are utilized today within Eastern Orthodoxy, where on earth were they considered apostolic? Now you can argue, well, this book is quoted in the New Testament. These books were used by early church fathers. Quotation doesn't equal canonicity. Quotation doesn't equal canonical. Otherwise, all kinds of pagan philosophers would be part of uh, canonical in that sense. And nobody argues that the early fathers utilized all kinds of books. But once the church gathered in council, the North African Code, when the apostolic churches were queried for the canon, the canon was laid out. And East and West agreed upon that canon. <coughs> for a long time. Agreed upon that canon. Now you might come back and say, well, Athanasius didn't. Athanasius is using canon in a very different manner. Very different manner. But talking about the North African code, Hippo, Carthage, and then Pope St. Agatha was very clear. At an ecumenical council, no less. East and West agreed on the issue of the canon. <clears throat> so I take issue when I hear when I hear that orthodoxy has preserved the apostolic faith better. Look, you can all day long point to those dastardly German bishops. I was just there in Germany not long back. I can agree. They're pretty dastardly. You can point to the faith being in shambles in Europe. Yeah, it is. I hung out in England for a while too. Yeah, those churches are dead. They're growing, but at the, at the rate that they're growing is a downright travesty. You can point to all kinds of scandals. I can tell you what, every apostolic faith has. But when we come to the table and we actually compare things that were believed early, early on, East and West, and that are denied today by the Eastern Orthodox, you've got a clear problem. Because you can all you want point to, well, you know what? You've got a few fathers that talked about Mary being a sinner. Guess what? Those that talk about Mary being a sinner was a condemned heretic origin. And don't give me the baloney that it was only origins, writings that were condemned. He was condemned. 
and an Aryan heretic that taught that Mary was a sinner. And I don't think any Eastern Orthodox would argue that she's a sinful, was a sinner. But I'll tell you one thing. Denial of the Immaculate Conception is a big problem. Because for Eastern Orthodox, the great Eastern saints believed it. And I know for a fact Kyle has read the works of Reverend Dr. Coppice. I know that. I guarantee you he's read it. I guarantee you he probably owns a copy of that book I have right here. I guarantee you he knows the history of Procatharthesa. But it's not so clear in the West. You've got to do your homework to know what they're talking about when they talk about the purification of Mary. But they're not talking about Mary being purified from sin. And belief, because it's a biblical teaching. It is biblical that Mary is a new ark. The early fathers taught it. The Bible taught it. It really just doesn't work if you're going to try and argue and tell me that Mary, for even a short period, was under the dominion of the devil, because that really is what it ultimately amounts to. If she had original sin, I'm sorry if you come back and tell me, oh, well, William, we don't view original sin that way. Well, the Bible does. Because in Genesis 3, it's very clear. That fall, that fall, those that are fallen are under the dominion of that dragon, of that serpent. But the mother and the Messiah are not. You see, <clears throat> maybe you wonder why Catholics utilize Genesis 3 over and over. Because the Eastern Fathers used it too. West, East, and Syriac Fathers all utilized it. The Latin Fathers, the Greek ones, and the Syriac. To show that our Immaculate Mother Mary was at complete enmity with the devil, thus never being under the dominion of the devil. And what is the context of the devil's grasp? In Genesis 3, it's the fall. It is the fall. Original sin. Original sin. I don't know what, uh, what phrase is being referred to. Apologize. Arthur, you are correct. Yeah, you're correct. It's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. Ah, I remember the name now. Um, Scalarius also affirmed it. I know his popularity has dropped in modern day times, but not in the olden times. <clears throat> he was venerated. Colorado. Yeah, you're correct. Partially, John, partially. Uh, yeah, I mean, Trent was merely reiterating the Florentine canon. But, John, you who are astute with the papacy, uh, you perhaps are not aware that even Agatho discusses the canon. You got it in Agatho, Pope St. Agatho the Great. And I added the great there. Uh, but it, Trent was merely reiterating Florin, the Florentine canon, which was clearly not an issue, not a contention at all. But yeah, you're right, John. It didn't have to condemn them. They're already called apocryphal. They're already called apocryphal. Very good point, John. Very, very good point. I appreciate that. I'm trying to see if there are any more comments. <clears throat> they connect Mary to Elijah, Enoch. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what the context was there, but great, great point there. Uh, Elijah, Enoch. Uh, yeah, some some fathers believe that uh, Elijah and Enoch would return to die. Some do. Uh, the tradition varied early on in the early church. It was really varied um, from father to father. <clears throat> I agree with you there, John, without a doubt. But I think the bigger problem is thinking that the Septuagint was canonized. I think that people that think that it was canonized don't know what they're talking about. And I know that it comes across as a very popular talking point. Hey, we canonized the Septuagint. 
you know, the early Jews, it was their Old Testament. The Septuagint was not canonized. I don't think people know what they're talking about. I agree with Arthur. <clears throat> I highly recommend, uh, I highly, highly recommend to go watch the debate that I had with the Reverend Dr. Ramsey on the Immaculate Conception. In my opinion, one of my favorite debates that I've ever done. Really recommend you go and you check it out. If anybody else has anything on their mind now, now is the time. Pickle Rick, do you believe the Immaculate Conception is biblical or that it isn't biblical, but that, that it's not important because the Father's a testament? Pickle Rick, I believe it is biblical and I believe it is ancient as well. At the end of the month, I will be debating on standing for truth, defending the Immaculate Conception. I truly do believe it is. You are right about that. You're right. Yeah, yeah, you are right, Mango, without a doubt. And I think that they are quite well aware of that as well. Yeah, not very good. They will read it completely different at times, depending on what individual you've encountered. They'll read it differently. Or at times, they will hilariously claim uh, an interpolation. They will claim that the Latins interpolated all kinds of flattery kind of language. Really, really, a lot of those arguments amount to nonsense and you don't find anybody, anybody in academia taking them seriously at all. Thank you very much, McVine. Yes, I do. In fact, that is my gift to my patrons. My gift is scholarly courses on all kinds of theological issues that I only have on Patreon. So the Immaculate Conception goes from the biblical era all the way to the fathers, councils, and everything, and I am doing it in English, and I am doing it in Spanish, and I've got tons of series exclusively that you can find there. Thank you for that plug, McVine. And hopefully, people, if you want to look at an in-depth look at the biblical canon, check that book out. I'd love to get a copy of that book to Kyle. Yeah, Byzantine flattery. <laughs> yeah, we've all heard that. And 75, God bless you. Hope you're doing well. Yep, I will keep going. If anybody does have anything on your mind, I will go for a few minutes longer and we'll wrap it up. I don't want to go too long because I know people will begin to tune out. But um, really, ultimately, ultimately, I said I would talk about the canon and the Immaculate Conception. Are there other issues that divide us? Of course. Papacy, filioque. Um, why did I bring up those particular issues? By the way, I brought them up because... Um, Elijah, the brother, pointed me to the comment he made in the Immaculate Conception and because I was pointed to the comment made by Kyle on the canon. By the way, <clears throat> the other issue that our Eastern friends are going to have a problem with is when you look at the critical editions of Polymus, when you look at what was utilized by Mark of Ephesus and those great Eastern saints, you're going to find... Uh, uh, that they held exactly to the Catholic canon the way Catholicism does today. Yet more evidence that our Eastern friends have moved further and further away from the apostolic faith. Now, I want to be very clear. Before I became Catholic, I discerned orthodoxy for a while. I did for a while before I became Catholic. Eventually converted to Catholicism. In fact, before I even became Catholic, I became near and dear friends with the Reverend Dr. Kleenever. And I remain friends to him this day, even though I ultimately chose Catholicism to convert to. Sure, he lamented that. But <clears throat> we have remained friends to this day. Is it possible that I can remain friends with Kyle? I haven't talked to him in a while. 
but I would definitely consider him a friend. And I've urged people to pray for him and to pray for his family. Hey, at the end of the day, Kyle could be exactly what orthodoxy need. A good guy doing videos that are trying to bridge the gap, looking for unity more than anything else. And do I hope one day Kyle returns to the fullness of the faith? I do. Would I be open to having him back on my show and dialoguing on any of the issues with him? Without a doubt. <clears throat> Kyle knows where to reach me. He has my private number. He can reach me there too. And I hope Kyle does know that I'm praying for him and praying for his family. Even if Kyle remains Orthodox for the rest of his life, I pray for him and I pray for his family. And I will not allow anybody, anyone, to come to my channel and trash him. I won't do it. See, there's a little thing that is different about me. When I go and I refute people, I don't just do it and hide behind a StreamYard link. I offer an open link to debate to anybody that doesn't agree with me. Anybody. I just I don't just do videos refuting people or rebutting people. I offer them the opportunity to debate and to prove to me that the Catholic faith is indeed incorrect on any given point. And thus, if people think that I am wrong on these issues, and you have studied the issues, and you are an apologist, or you've written a book or something, then most definitely feel free to reach out to me. <clears throat> I don't just have anybody on my platform, though. I want to be very clear. I am very, 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 very meticulous in who I allow on to my platform. Very, very careful there. Curious what the Indian Catholic Church tradition says about the Immaculate Conception. They seem to give us early mentions of the, dorm, of the Dormition. <clears throat> uh, it, if it is the, if it's any Catholic Church holds to it, brother, if it is a Catholic Church, they all hold to it. Now, would a <clears throat> Eastern Catholic Church or Syriac, would they have a way of defining it in a particular way in their tradition? Without a doubt. Like over in the Latin West, primarily we refer to the Assumption as the, the Feast of the Assumption. And over here in the, in, the, um, in the Catholic East, there's a heavy emphasis on the Dormition. Is there a difference in belief? No. No, not at all. Catholics believe that she had a holy Dormition, a holy falling asleep. Then she was taken body and soul into heaven to be with our incarnate Lord. Let me go down. I want to make sure that I do. Yeah, no doubt about that. Yeah, even the Vulgate. Yeah, nobody's doubting that. Yeah, yeah, even the Vulgate. Even many early, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the Gloss Ordinaria as well. Uh, even uh, translates books that are not canonical. Yeah, no doubt. The issue is, what is canonical? Not that other books are utilized or not. Now, could we ever say the third or fourth Maccabees are valuable and ecclesiastical as they were used by the early church? Without a doubt. But are they canonical? No, they're not canonical. Trent was clear. Some of these books are flat out called apocryphal. And the idea that the canon is open? Come on. Solomon, you are correct. <clears throat> and it is also what makes the most sense biblically as well. And when we look at the writings of the early fathers, I agree with you. Uh, I will always, if I am going to do a video refuting Gavin Ortland, Kyle, Turretin fan, anybody, in my opinion, you, what are you doing refuting people if you're not saying, I'll debate you as well, set it up on any platform? I'm not going to do a video refuting somebody and also not offering the extension to debate them in a scholarly moderated debate. I will always do that. Uh, isn't that what you're supposed to do if you're an apologist? Defend the faith?
Yeah, great point there, Arthur. Great, great point. Now, anybody, if there are any questions, I will remain on for about five more minutes. And then I am going to go probably play a video game with my daughter. Why? Because I have been deep at work. Let me tell you, everybody, you're going to want to hear this. Praise the Lord. I'm working on a book for Catholic Answers. I will announce it, God willing, very soon. Working on a book for Catholic Answers, and I'm working on an article that will come out in their magazine on orthodoxy. God willing, will come out very soon. But I have been at work working on that and debate prepping and finishing up our book on the Immaculate Conception. So I've been at it. Usually my days are about 10 to 12 hours. All that I've been doing is working on theological material. So I'm going to have to play a video game with my daughter in a bit, or she'll probably throw a rock at my head if I don't. But keep an eye out. We've been working on an Immaculate Conception book for about two years. It will be full of brand new translations, including many that you haven't heard of. Earlier, you heard, of, you heard me bring up the Act of Ephesus. You might not even know what I'm talking about there, do you? Only a select few know what I'm talking about because they've looked at. We have a select small group of people that have looked at rough drafts of our upcoming Immaculate Conception book. There is no book out there like it. There is no book out there modern day or even the past many, 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 many years that deals primarily with the Immaculate Conception. We have that one we're working on and our Perpetual Virginity book. When we're done with them, get sent off to edit. We work on purchasing the rights for artwork, which can get pricey, which is why any support you can offer us, whether it be Patreon or PayPal, we greatly appreciate it. It goes to our ministry because of the costs that we run for books we purchase and for the artwork that we've got to purchase because we don't use, we don't like using artwork found in the open domain. We either commission someone to do fresh artwork or we purchase rights, which can come out to be quite costly. costly. So please consider becoming a patron if you can or donate in any way. Uh, multiple projects we have to announce. Please pray for us. We'd greatly appreciate it. Please, please pray for us. Now, yeah, I, I, I think that that is really misunderstood, Root of David, because you're going to find East and West not knowing how to lay out what we believe on original sin. And I hope to bridge that gap when I debate the Reverend Dr. Ramsey in under a month. I'll be debating him on Swansona's channel. And I hope to bridge that gap. We're going to have a robust scholarly debate in the issue. And I really need your prayers. I really, really hope you pray for me. Because a lot of Catholics don't know how to describe original sin. They don't know how to lay it out. They really don't. And it confuses them a great amount. And I really, really do think that it'll be an edifying debate. And I hope it'll be an edifying debate. John, why are you the man? Why are you the man? You're probably walking around with 23-inch biceps. You're the man. Because you know very well, our councils condemned that idea. They condemned that idea. John, you're the man. You are the man. And that is an area that a lot of Catholics just don't know how to lay out very clearly at all. Yes, that's correct. You're right. And we get blamed by Calvinists and many others. They'll claim that we believe the way they do on that issue. They have no idea. They don't know what we believe. But sadly, a lot of work isn't being done in this field by Catholics. So God willing, I'll be able to bridge that gap. <clears throat> Please consider getting our book on the canon that I co-authored with the Reverend Dr. Coppice. Consider getting a copy of that. 23 inches, baby. There you go. Yeah. By the way, I hit the gym earlier. I feel great. I'm on fire. I'm on fire for the faith, of course. Uh, yep, you are right, John. Amen, brother. Amen, brother. I'm glad that you are a super mod here, that you're a super mod. 
Anybody else, if you are consistently here on my channel participating, I will eventually make you a mod. If you think you deserve to be a mod already and I've forgotten to make you a mod, if you think you should already be a mod, do me a favor and reach out to me and just tell me, William, what are you doing? I need to be a mod. I'm always there. William at patristicpillars.com. And I'll check it out. And God willing, make you a mod. Everybody, thank you very much. Christian Catholic Media, thank you for all the work you've done, brother. Thank you very much. Everybody, we're going to wrap it up now. And as we always do, we're going to wrap it up with that incredible, wonderful, beautiful Ave Maria. Really, really doesn't get better than that. Being able to honor our Immaculate Mother Mary. We can't honor her more than our Lord would have honored her. Everybody, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for tuning in. I think at one point we had over 200 for a late Saturday night. You guys are incredible. God bless you. God keep you. Please consider, if you are able, there's a link right there. Consider becoming a patron. We love you all. Get a copy of that book as well. If you want to know more of the canon issue, get a copy of that book. Everybody, God bless you. God keep you. I'll be praying for you. Consider praying for me. Thank you.